morning. Our first song today is Rise Up and Praise Him, so it makes sense that we all stand together and worship <laughs> our Lord. Let the heavens Thousands of 
desire to be near you. And so I just pray that uh, um, we'd be able to accomplish that today. And part of it is holy living. So I just pray that uh, we would make our hearts right before you in this moment if they are not holy. In Jesus' name. Just pray that you might be present here this morning. We know that you are. I know there has to be at least two or three gathered in your name. Your word promises that you'll be here. But I pray, Lord, that we just might uh, respond to the prompting of your Holy Spirit. 
that we not, uh, might not build walls around our hearts, <laughs> but uh, that you would shine your light of truth into our hearts and that we might respond. We pray, Lord, that these gifts that we give might be used for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I would invite you to please stand with us again as we sing our next set of songs.
And I thank you for getting together so that we could praise you today, Lord. And I pray that um, as Pastor comes up to speak today, you give him the words and that we can absorb them and we can learn more about you through him. In Jesus' name, amen. That includes us, too. We're part of that team, huh? So the first song we sang, I don't know if you caught it or not. It says, uh, talks about where God's glory dwells. Where does God's glory dwell? Yeah, yeah. As a Christian, you, right? Okay. So it's interesting how, you know, we, we think about that, and yet as believers, we know that God's Spirit is within us, and so his glory is there. And we just will experience that and know that and be glorified completely when we go to be with him. Something to think about. I am free. I am a slave. I am free. I am a slave. I am free. I am a slave. Now, when you hear that come out, those same lines, I am free and I am a slave coming out of the same mouth, you start to wonder, is this guy nuts? Is this true? Can they both be true? Or is one obviously uh, wrong and the other one is right? What say ye? Yes. (laughs) Good. Good. So sometimes we have these, these, these conflicting or seemingly conflicting type statements, but they are both true in this case. I am free. I am free. Jesus Christ has set me free from sin and death, but I am a slave in that I am a slave to Jesus Christ, right? So as Christians, we are free, but we are also slaves to Christ. And so even though there seems to be some tension in those things, if we kind of get a little bit nitpicky on it and get into the details, we can see that the Bible says both those things are true. And there's no contradiction at all. I say that because this morning as we're going to continue on in 1 Corinthians, and we, we were, uh, didn't meet last week or didn't have the lesson from 1 Corinthians or the sermon from 1 Corinthians because... We had Aaron Myers here delivering to us a good message, a reminder to us in the book of Jonah about, you know, going and being willing to go uh, to the people that God um, uh, wants us to to go to uh, because of who God is, because of um, his desire and his willingness to, to bring people to repentance, to save people even if those people aren't necessarily the ones we want to save, right? That's what Jonah's problem was. Remember at the end, he said, see, I I told you that, God. I knew that. You're this way. You save these kinds of people, you know? And he didn't want that, and that's why he didn't go. So it it was a timely reminder to us about, you know, what God is doing and what our part is in it. And sometimes that may be the case. You know, many times because, um, because God as our, Jesus Christ as our master will call us into things and challenge us to do things that we wouldn't otherwise do ourselves. That's part of how he grows us. That's part of how he uses us for his glory too. So I say these things uh, as we get into 1 Corinthians here, chapter 8, because there seems to be some, some struggle within this community. Remember, we're talking about them being wise and, and, um, and, and knowledgeable about things. But yet, as Paul is writing this letter, he's saying there's some wisdom there, but your wisdom is incomplete. Your wisdom doesn't seem to be infused, if you will, with the truth of God's word. And so Paul is correcting them in these types of things as the 
as he's written to them and they've written back to him and there's, there's different things that are coming up here and they probably are saying, well, what about this? And what about this? And what about this statement? Is this statement true? Or what about this? Or we know these things. And so Paul has to, you know, tell him to hold on here, think about what you're saying and let me inform your thinking here. And so that's what he does here in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 8. And I don't have this. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, all right. What we'll do here. Okay. So, uh, so what we're going to do here is uh, in your little handout that you have here, the uh, half sheet that's inside, the outline that you have, it says, include a big box for love in your choices checkoff list. And so here's, a, here's a, my version of a big box for love. In your choices checkoff list. That's my, the extent of my artistic talent there. And so I thought I would try to do that just to give you a picture for it. Because when we make choices, we make decisions, we have these, usually a list of things. Can I do this? Or what about this? And what about this? And so we're checking off things to see how, uh, uh, you know, if it meets certain criteria uh, uh, for, for a wise decision here. And so sometimes... We make a decision, and it's just based upon, quote, unquote, the facts, okay? But there needs to be a a consideration of love in our decision-making here, in the choices that we choose for ourselves. And so this is the idea of what I think the Apostle Paul is saying to us, what God is saying to us through this letter that Paul writes to the Corinthians. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and we'll go through that uh, this morning. Now, concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, quotes there, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge. But some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. So as we go through this passage here, We're seeing here that Paul continues to deal with questions that they're asking. And this question this morning is, what about food offered to idols? And they're telling him, you know, food offered to idols is really nothing. You know, it's just food offered to idols, isn't it? Can I eat that if I want to? And so he says, now concerning food offered to idols. Oh, I'll give you that first point there. Nobody knows everything, though there are know-it-alls. Okay? (laughs) Nobody knows everything, though there are know-it-alls. I think that's what Paul says here in verses 1 through 3. Now, concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us... You get that, Connie? Okay, well... No or no? Okay. So... uh, So as he's commenting there, they have this... This, this pushback, right? He's writing to them, and they're going to tell them about their knowledge. They're going to tell them about how informed they are in things and how 
wise they are, how sophisticated they become in their knowledge as Christians in this society there in Corinth. Now, concerning food offered to idols, we know that, and if you see it, it's in quotes there, that an idol has no real existence. And we would agree with that, right? Right? Right, okay, okay. Okay, it has no real existence, meaning that even though you can have, not to say there's no such thing as idols, there are such things as idols, but idols do not represent a true God behind them. They're just idols. They're just whatever, manufactured. You can get this in in Romans chapter 1 where Paul uh, writes that letter there, and he talks about how in any any society there's, there's a creation of God's idols, quotes, and it looks like creatures that have been created, okay? Because they reject the true worship of the true God, the maker, the creator, and they worship things created instead. So this is the idea of idols here. And so Paul says here, okay, all of us possess knowledge uh, uh, concerning food offers to I- offered to idols. We know that all of us possess knowledge. And so he's getting with these guys. And once again, that's a quote there. So he's probably responding to something that they said. And this idea is that we know something. We know something. We possess knowledge, as he says there. They know. They're smart, you know. But sometimes people who know some things think they know everything, and so we call them know-it-alls. But nobody knows everything, though there are know-it-alls, right? This is what he says. All of us possess knowledge. He says, okay, we got some knowledge. Good. We understand some things. But he says, but this knowledge puffs up. Okay, so what? Knowledge puffs up. Isn't knowledge good? How many of you agree knowledge is good? How many of you disagree? You'd rather know nothing. Okay. Thank you for uh, raising your hand that knowledge was good. Okay. So he says here, but this knowledge puffs up. But then he talks about love. But love builds up. So what is he going on with here? Why is he just kind of all of a sudden jump around here? Because he's talking about knowledge. He's saying you know some things. Knowledge is good, but knowledge puffs up. Knowledge without love is really what he means. Knowledge by itself, just having the facts, causes one to be prideful, right? You know any people like that? They're very knowledgeable about things there. And so Uh, For instance, if you try to do work on your own car and here's a master mechanic who knows how to do all that sort of stuff, they kind of laugh at you when they see the sorts of things that you do to try to fix your car, right? No, it's happened to me. Maybe it's not happened to you. (laughs) Maybe you are the master mechanics there, okay? So he's saying here, this knowledge puffs up. People get filled with things. They know things. They have knowledge. Because of this knowledge, they get prideful. Have you ever felt like that? I mean, you see it in little kids all the time, you know. One plus one is two. Two times two is, and the one who doesn't know that is like, oh, I don't do times yet. I only do arithmetic. Funny, (laughs) I got to share this with you. Back a long time ago, my son, Scotty, he was, I don't know, he's like second grade or something like that. I don't know, first grade. I don't know what it is. And so he and this girl were in, after Sunday school, having this little quote unquote discussion and she said that girls are smarter than boys and he said no boys are smarter than girls and so she said well do you know what four times nine is or something like that and he said 36 and she said oh and we didn't know we hadn't taught scotty timetables yet and so we asked him how did you know that and he says oh i was playing on the calculator and so I, <laughs> Nine X four is thirty six, so that's how he figured it out, you know. And he remembered that. So it's just kind of funny how you get a little bit of a little bit of knowledge. You think, well, I'm superior because of that, you know. I know more than you. Um, so he he says here, this knowledge puffs up. But he says, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something. He does not yet know as he ought to know. 
So all of a sudden, Paul jumps into this thing about love, but love builds up. So he's going to compare, in a sense, here what knowledge is and the benefit of knowledge, but let's look at the importance of love, even with your knowledge, I think is what he's trying to say. What he's saying, I don't know if I'm getting it right, I guess it should say. So if anyone imagines, and so he says, if anyone seems to know something, he doesn't really know it as he ought to know it. And he's referring not just as not just a statement being, being said or being written down in a vacuum. It's a statement that comes into a context where someone is talking about food being offered to idols and that sort of situation there in Corinth. And so he says here, if anyone imagines that he knows something, the word imagines is really the word seems, seems because it seems like, and this, it's the, the Greek word dakeo, and it means it seems like, or, or I seem to think, I seem to see it that way. And this is actually, a, in the book of 1 John, they think that that's what one of the challenges that John was writing about there in the first century, that there was a group of people there known as docetists, and that was the idea that they saw or seemed to think of Jesus. He seemed to be that way. He really wasn't there. He was an illusion that we thought we saw, and so it seemed to be that way. And so that's why John, if you think about what First John writes about, he says, what we have seen, what we have seen, what we have touched, what we have heard, all these things, he's actually... You know, writing a, a, the word polemic against them, an argument against these kinds of people there. And here's this idea here about someone seeming to understand. Someone, they imagine that they know something. He says he does not yet know as he ought to know. That's kind of funny, huh? You know, but you don't know the way you're supposed to know. The way that uh, the word ought there is, is the way that it's necessary for you to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. So what Paul gets into here is he talks about love now, and he's going to say, your knowledge, you're going to get into the, the, this doctrinal discussion here or this theological argument, and, and we get into these things, and you can see people just kind of getting into these types of arguments. There are papers written. There are books written about these types of things that one, one group of theologians believes this way or one theologian believes this way and one theologian believes this way, and they're writing stuff against each other, and, and, they're, and, and they're like, I think it's splitting hairs. Maybe it's just because I'm not smart enough to understand but here's what Paul says, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. And so he says the discussion about doctrine, about theology is, is good, but what really comes down to is love. And this is not love in the kind of like, whoo, you know, 60s, 1960s love for those that you remember. Free love, everything's groovy, you know. Ooh, you guys didn't know I knew that word, did you? So... He says that, you know, this idea of love is about loving God. If you, you know, if you love God, then he is known by God. And this idea about loving God is really manifest in how somebody lives their life and how they live their life in community with other believers especially. And so he says, that, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. So he's basically saying that love is better than knowledge. Okay? That's kind of the way I would just... Bring it down there. Love is better than knowledge. He continues on with the argument here. Did I get past that? Uh, wow, did I pass through that already? Okay. Second point is a knowledge without love leads to stumbling. So as he comes in here and, and continues on with this argument, talking about if anyone loves God, he is known by God, then he's going to move into the matter at hand, the issue at hand. This food being offered to idols and how love comes into play in this situation. Because it doesn't seem like love has any place in this argument. Okay? But he tells us and he shows us how that's not the case. That love really does come into play here. How important it is. So knowledge without love leads to stumbling. Verse 4. Therefore... As to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence. In quotes there. Once again, we talked about that. Yeah, we would say there's no real existence. It's not anything there. 
okay? And that there is no God but one God, right? And so we would agree with that sort of thing. And so this is what this community was saying. Well, there's no such thing as idols. There's really only one God, and we know who that God is. And because we have this knowledge, because we know these things, we're kind of free to do what we want to do when it comes to eating food that's been offered to idols. And so the idea of food being offered to idols is that a lot of uh, the, the food that would, would be offered to these idols and then afterwards whatever was left over, they might sell carcasses or something like that in a quote-unquote meat market. And then people would buy these things and people would say, you can't eat that. It's been offered to idols. Have you ever eaten food offered to idols? Knowingly? There you go. Hey, you know, and, and when we go, if you ever go to San Francisco, any of the local restaurants there, you know, not the big franchises, although they might too, but you find these little shrines in the restaurants there. They're there all, all over the place there. You just go in there, there's incense burning, usually has a smell to it and everything like that. And so when you walk in there, I can't eat. I, I never had a problem with it. I just go in there and eat, you know. <laughs> I never thought twice about it. It's just food, you know? It's just food. But you see those things there, and I guess if somebody really had a problem with it, they let me know, then I might have to change my behavior there. Okay? But yeah, you see it, and you know. And so he's saying here, okay, here's this meat, here's this food that's there. Um, As to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but but one. For although there may be so-called gods... Uh, in heaven or on earth, and he's just going on there. People are making all these little things up there. Uh, Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So he's just saying what we understand is Christian doctrine, okay? There's not any gods. Not, there are idols out there. People have idols, but they're not representative of any real god. Sometimes, sometimes in demons, spiritual forces will use that sort of worship of those things to cause people to get tripped up. That's for sure. Okay? But, but just because it's that thing doesn't mean it has power in and of itself. So sometimes my mom, she brought home stuff from the Philippines a long time ago, I guess when she, they first came over, you know, and this stuff was things that was probably could be deemed religious, but all we saw it as Filipino culture, you know, and there are things that in my wife's family that it's just culture, Okay. It really could be religious, but they weren't religious. It was just a cultural thing. So it's not a superstition there is what I'm saying. But sometimes people think like that. So when we, uh, there's a tradition uh, in my wife's culture that every New Year's, and this is the Lunar New Year when they celebrate it within her her family's community, their uh, culture, is that you give red envelopes and they have money in them. And the name of the money is called, in English, lucky money. And so we give lucky money. I don't say, oh, this is lucky money. I say, here, <laughs> you know. And what do my kids do? They take the money out of the envelope and they throw the envelope away. Okay? Okay. But some people who don't understand that might think, whoa, you called it lucky money. You really are superstitious. You're into this religion thing there, and you're worshiping idols or whatever. And it's not that way. And if it caused somebody that, maybe I would just give my kids money outside of the red envelope. Okay? The red envelope has to have some writing on the outside of it, too. Usually... Chinese character or something like that. That means good luck, okay? So um, there, there are these little things there, and sometimes people, you know, they, they, 
they, they don't understand, and so they start to, you know, point the finger here. And Paul is saying here right now, he says, yet for us, verse 6, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Verse 7, however, not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. So now he says, okay, so we have this knowledge. What you say is true. It's fine. That's right. There's only one, there's only one God. There's only one Lord. Okay? And now, however, not everybody understands all of that, that these idols don't have this power or that, that they don't have any meaning because the, here's a person who's basically come out of that life and it affected them. And so now that they see other people just kind of, you know, being there and being really, quote, unquote, free and easy about it, that it bothers them. They have some scruples about that. I kind of liken this to, you know, um, when I was young, a long time ago, in the 70s, uh, thinking about the rock music that came out, you know. I know real rock music came out in the 50s, but the rock music that came out in the 70s. My sister liked that. She used to go to these live concerts there, listen to all these, these, uh, these groups. I was more of an R&B type of guy. I've always been that way. So I didn't really get into it, okay? But it turns out that when I became saved and got into the church, that there was some struggle there about the kind of music that was being played in the early 80s. And the thing is, here were people who came out of the rock and roll, and they associate all the different things with that kind of music. Maybe it was the drugs. Maybe it was the lifestyle. And so whenever they thought about that, it kind of got into this, you know, their mindset. And so it became a stumbling block if there was anything that sounded like that in the church. And so for the sake of that, you wouldn't push that necessarily. We wouldn't put that in people's faces because somebody had some scruples about that. You say, hey, we don't have to sing these songs, right? We don't have to sing this song. There's nothing that says we have to sing these songs. And so for the sake of those, quote, unquote, weaker ones, we won't. We had a person who came into the church, and they had kind of a misunderstanding about some things, and it was kind of hard to educate them. But one of the things they had trouble with is we had a cross hanging up on the, the wall. And they said, that's an idol. You're not supposed to have anything there. And so we had to explain to them. But they still stumbled over it for a while. They said, if we took it down, would you come still? Yes. So we did. We would, the cross is just a, is a symbol, is it not? Or is, is it that cross that we have to have there? It's a symbol, right? It is. If, if we did it this, if we did it in now in our days and Jesus came here and he was executed as a criminal, we would probably have an electric chair there or, you know, a bunch of syringes, right? Lethal injection. And we, that would be the reminder of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. He suffered a, a criminal's death. Somebody who was condemned to death who had no sin in him, but was condemned for our sin, right? That's really what the cross is about, okay? So sometimes we stumble over those things. So he says here, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol. means if they eat it and it's been offered to an idol, it really means to them that they've done something. They've really committed some sort of religious act in this. And so he says, and their conscience being weak is defiled. It means it really affects them, okay? They feel bad about that if they find out that what they did was eat food that was offered to idols. So here, verse 8 says, food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do, right? So I have... 
a family member who doesn't eat meat. He doesn't eat dairy products. He's a vegan. Is he more holy than I am? Is that the way I'm supposed to eat? Or does he have to eat the way I have to eat? Well, if he's at our house, we have to buy him food. But, you know, but food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. So if you want to eat pork, go ahead and eat pork. If you're a chicken person, that's okay too. If you don't eat beef because you don't like how beef is raised, that's on you. You don't have to eat beef. I will have my beef. Right? We're no worse off or no better off whether we eat or we don't eat. It's kind of a quote-unquote neutral thing, but he says it's not really a neutral thing when it comes to how it affects people. And so we need to be sensitive to that. So here's what he says in verse 9. He says, but take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. So this idea about knowledge uh, without loss uh, or, or knowledge uh, without love leads to stumbling, it's this knowledge that exercises it in the form of liberty with a disregard for somebody around them. Paul says here, but take care that this right of yours, he didn't say you don't have the right, he says you do have the right, that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. And so he's telling us to voluntarily renounce our right for the sake of somebody else. That's a Christian thing to do, isn't it? Within the Christian community and in, in Christianity, the idea is that those who are stronger are supposed to help out those who are weaker. And so he says, but take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Because here's somebody who comes out of that lifestyle and sees you doing what you're doing, and all of a sudden, they stumble. So back in the, way back before my time, people would tell me they couldn't go to movie theaters because people thought those movie theaters were evil. And I don't know how you deal with all that legalistically, but some people were said that they wouldn't even walk on the same side of the street where the movie theater was so that they wouldn't look like they just came out of the movie theater and be accused of going to the movies. And that was their way of saying, I'm going to avoid all, all form, uh, uh, the, the, what does it say? A form, the, I mean, uh, uh, re, the appearance of evil, right? I'm going to, I'm going to try to uh, uh, get away from any appearance of evil, avoiding the appearance of evil. And so that's what they would do. The Bible does not condemn drinking. The Bible condemns drunkenness. I say this because there are some people, because of their family history, I had a professor in seminary who was that way. He said, you cannot tell me there's anything good that comes out of drinking. Because he used to have to go to the bar and get the paycheck from his dad every Friday so that his dad wouldn't spend it all there and, and the family would go without, you know? So his experience of alcohol and seeing somebody involved with that is bad, bad, bad. There's nothing good about it. He didn't want, you know, he, he, he saw it that way. Well, if it becomes a stumbling block, do you have to go in and drink? Well, it's my right. What about those who cause us to stumble? See, we're going to get into this knowledge thing, and Jesus is kind of getting down to the, to the nitty-gritty here. What does it mean for us to be Christ followers? What is this idea about love and being concerned about the weaker ones in the community? How do we deal with that? How do we show love with one another? But take care that the right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. The last point is knowledge cannot rationalize away. I say rationalize away sin, okay? You can't get around it. And this is what Paul says. Knowledge cannot rationalize away sin. This is what Paul says. This is what God is saying to us in verse 10. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge, 
eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? So here it is. Here's the picture here. Here's somebody who seems to be a mature follower of Christ. Here's somebody who maybe came to know Christ out of uh, uh, that kind of background, idolatry, uh, an, an idolater, and they see this person, and this guy's inside the temple, it says here, sees you eating inside the, an idol's temple, and you're eating food there, and, and, and he's going to say, well, he, he does it, right? Don't we do that? We do that all the time, right? That's how we measure holiness. We do, right? Uh, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I'm better than them. I'm more holy. That's not how God measures it, but that's how we try to measure it. And so here's the picture. Here's somebody who's more mature. And so this guy is going to say, oh, well, I'm going to kind of follow this person here. Now, it says, for if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so, verse 11, by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. And so here's the effects here. So whether you thought what you were doing was good or not, and you had a right to do it, look at the result. And because of the very result, you know that's not, in, that's not a good thing. We're not supposed to be doing that to each other. He says here, this is the one for whom Christ died, verse 12, thus sinning. But I have a right to do this. It's not explicitly wrong in the Bible. Now Paul says it's sinning. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. I I didn't do anything against Jesus. I have a right to do this. But now you're causing stumbling of somebody else. Is that right for you to exercise your right? Doesn't seem right. Paul found this out the hard way. You remember what it turns out in in Acts chapter 9? He's on the road to Damascus, and what happens there? He comes to faith, right? Jesus says and says, why are you persecuting me? Paul says, who are you, Lord? I I wasn't persecuting you. I was persecuting some Christians. That's how Jesus sees it. When we harm one another... We're harming him. Think about it. I I didn't make it up. I think this is what the scripture says. And he says, for your right, you're doing this. Hopefully, I don't think this is all new to you, you know, because it's not new to me. But the thing is, is where does it, where does the application come into our lives now? Now that we're sophisticated and we know And we're all about grace. Paul says here, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. How about that? What a commitment, huh, to community. What a commitment to Christ. What a commitment to one another. Do we make that kind of choice? Are we mature enough and filled with love enough to make those kinds of choices? Or is it, hey, you know what? My right. I do whatever I want. I'm free to do it. It's America. Drinking is one of the things that comes up here. I told you about the professor there. Drinking, I told you, it's clear in the scriptures that drunkenness is, to be, is, is, is not good. It's a sin. It's not supposed to be happening. So some people say, hey, I, well, I can drink. You know, I'm okay. I can drink. I can't drink. I don't see it good, any good coming to drink. I have a background where my father, my grandfather, both drank. My father still drinks. I have a background where I used to drink for the sole reason to get drunk. There's not anything enjoyable about the taste of alcohol to me, no matter how many sweeteners you put in it. If it's too sweet, it's not going to do what I intend for it to do, so why do it, right? So years ago, when I first started dating Jermaine, she said, why are you drinking? I don't like it. 
I've not drunk since. You know, so this could be one of those things. It could be, and don't, I'm not pointing out anything to anybody, okay? It could be the way you dress. You know, back when the, I guess it all started around maybe in the 90s or something where the dress of ladies just got to get more and more, you know, revealing. It was Madonna or whoever it was that started it. I'm not sure. But, you know, and then you say, well, I have a right to wear this dress like this. I can get dressed like this. I can dress any way I want. It's my right. But you think about how it affects people around you, especially young men. And guys, you too, you know. Everything's all tight and snug these days, you know. Got to make sure we show them we got guns, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Is that right? If it's causing somebody to stumble, is it right? Well, you're just jealous, Scott, because you don't have the body I have. Well, I don't. And yes, I am. No. (laughs) No. But you know, I mean, if it's causing somebody to stumble, and I don't want to get nitpicky here, I'm giving you these couple of little examples because I don't want it to go through everything and all of a sudden we start coming around, ooh, ooh, that's offensive to me, or that's offensive to me. And it's not the idea of offensive, it's what's causing us to stumble. You know? And so we have to think about those kinds of things. This is what it means for us to be Christian. This is what it means for us to follow Christ. It's not I just do whatever I want to do. I'm free but I'm a slave to Christ. And this is what it means to love him, to love his people. And so we do without certain things for that very reason. I don't drive a Cadillac. I don't drive a Mercedes Benz. I try to be simple with the cars that I drive. Why? I don't want anybody stumbling about, whoa, you know, pastor driving a cool car, you know. Because people do that, right? Nice, convertible BMW, top of the line, yeah, yeah. It's California, I wouldn't do that out here. Too much gravel, you know? (laughs) (laughs) But you know, you make those kinds of choices and you say, well, I have a right to do whatever I want. Well, no, if it's going to cause somebody to stumble, no. And so the, the big principle here is this idea about how does this affect others in terms of their walk with Christ? If it doesn't affect them at all, and it's not explicitly wrong, you're free to do it. But if it begins to become a stumbling block to somebody, or somehow or another what you're doing is causing a stumbling block to them, and they're not willing to look at the scriptures for the truth of what it is in there, then we have to nurture them along. For the sake of the person who has, quote-unquote, scruples, that's what it means when it says weaker conscience. Not weaker in that they're weaker, it's more sensitive. And so, for the sake of them, then maybe we should say, no, I'm not going to do that. I am free to do as I please. I have a responsibility to my brothers and sisters in Christ. So when you're making your choices, your decisions, look for that big checkoff box that says love on it and make sure that box is checked. If you do that, I think it'll just kind of guide us in what we need to do and make sure we make the wise and right decision. Let's stand and I'll close this in prayer. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of love. We thank you on the personal level, God, each one of us who knows you through your son, Jesus Christ, who knows the way, the truth, and the life, who knows our sins are forgiven and that we have eternal life. We love you, God. We know that you're about love, and we thank you on that very personal level. But coming to know you, you've informed us as well. Though we like to say that Christianity isn't about religion, it's about a relationship, 
a, a better statement would be that it's about relationships, ours to you and ours to one another, our brothers and sisters in Christ. As good as you are, as loving as you are, God, we want that all for ourselves. But when it comes to us being like that with others, sometimes we have a hard time of dealing with it. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the empowerment of your Holy Spirit that we can renounce our own rights when it comes to looking out for our brother and sister in Christ. Lord, sometimes we're not aware of anything like that, and we don't want to be nitpicky around here, but we do want love to permeate our decisions, oh God. So we ask that you would help us with that. We pray that you'd forgive us for the times where we've been selfish and we willfully have disregarded the feelings of somebody around us for what we wanted to do. And I pray now, Lord, that as we come before you in this way, that we would renew this idea, if you will, of loving you and letting that love manifest itself in how we make decisions that affect one another. Let us grow in this love. Let us grow in this grace so that you might be glorified in it. We thank you for having given us this time. We pray that we would leave here now in the spirit of love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This has been a ministry of the Grace Bible Church. If you're looking for a church home, or you would just like to come and visit, please be assured of a warm welcome. Our Sunday school begins at 945, and the morning service at 1045.